All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thanks for joining in to today's webinar on uh, separated bike lanes. Uh, we're excited to have you all uh, hopefully back. Hopefully many of you attended part one of the separated bike lane webinars last week. Uh, today we're going to get into part two of our separated bike lanes webinar series uh, focusing on uh, design considerations uh, for separated bike lanes. And we're excited uh, to have a group of panelists here with us to talk through some of these issues. Um, my name is Dan Jolene. I will be facilitating the webinar today. Uh, we're joined by a few different panelists today. I'll introduce them now. Uh, Dan Goodman is here. He works in the livability uh, team within the Federal Highway Administration's Office of Human Environment. Uh, he'll be sharing some information about the work that uh, FHWA is doing uh, to promote bicycle network improvements, uh, including separated bike lanes. Uh, ben Rosenblatt is here. He's a senior transportation or a senior planner with uh, Sam Schwartz Transportation Consultants. Uh, ben is going to uh, help talk us through a lot of the technical information today, and he helped lead the development of the separated bike lane uh, planning and design guide for FHWA. Uh, unfortunately, Carl Sundstrom uh, isn't here with us today, uh, but Ben will be able to cover for Carl and, uh, and talk through all this information for us. Uh, we'll also be hearing today from Mike Amston, uh, who is the Assistant Director of Transportation Planning uh, with the Chicago Department of Transportation. Uh, he'll be really talking to us about some of the uh, separated bike lane work uh, going on right now in Chicago uh, and, and talking about a few of the points that we'll bring up during our um, presentations today. Uh, we're really thrilled uh, to have all these panelists here with us today, uh, and we're really looking forward uh, to the presentations and the discussion. I'd like to just uh, shift gears a moment um, and go through some housekeeping items. Um, attendees, if you can hear me, I want to ask if you can please click the hand icon that's located in the upper left-hand corner of your screen. Uh, that will indicate to me that you can hear me and that uh, we're coming through uh, loud and clear. Uh, okay, great. Lots of hands going up. Excellent. Um, thanks again for letting me know about that. And we're thrilled so many people are able to sit in on this session today. Um, if for any reason uh, your computer freezes up during the webinar, please just reload the website and log back into the program. You should be able to just the session. Um, we'll be posting the presentation slides and a recording of the webinar to our PBIC website, uh, so you will be able to look back at anything that you missed. Uh, the presentation slides uh, should be available uh, with later today or maybe early tomorrow, uh, and the video archive should be available within uh, one to two days as well. Uh, please note that attendees will not be able to speak during the webinar, although you will have the ability to submit questions and comments using the chat function. Please feel free to ask questions at any time. Uh, and we'll hold about 20 to 30 minutes at the end uh, for a discussion session with our present, uh, presenters. Uh, later today, you're going to be receiving a follow-up email from the UNC Highway Safety Research Center uh, with a link that will allow you to generate a certificate of attendance for the webinar. If you're attending the webinar with multiple attendees at your site, uh, please just make sure to uh, forward this message to each of them so that they can also uh, produce a certificate of attendance. The email you receive will also include a link to the website where we'll post the presentation materials from today's webinar, uh, including the slides and the video archive. Uh, the webinar has been submitted to the American Planning Association to be considered for 1.5 CM credits. Uh, please check the online AICP event calendar uh, for more information about that. Uh, you can learn more about PBIC webinars, uh, check out our past webinars, or register for upcoming sessions by visiting pedbikeinfo.org uh, slash webinars. Uh, before we move on with the presentation, I wanted to see if you all could help me out uh, with a quick poll. Uh, we just are interested in finding out about how many people are out there listening to the webinar today. Um, so please just select the option that best fits uh, your group. If you're just attending by yourself, let us know if you've got a small group with you, uh, maybe a group of uh, six or seven or eight or more people um, in the room. Please just let us know about how many people are out there. We'll keep this poll open for maybe 10 more seconds, and then we'll move right along with the presentation. Okay. All right. Thanks, everybody. I'm going to go ahead and close this down, get your votes in. All right. Thanks very much. We really appreciate the information. Um, we're going to go ahead and continue things on now with uh, Dan Goodman from the Federal Highway Administration. Uh, Dan, go right ahead whenever you're ready. Okay. Thank you so much, Dan. Uh, my name is Dan Goodman. Um, I serve on the livability team in the Office of Human Environment. Um, which is in the Office of Planning, Environment, and Realty at the Federal Highway Administration. Um, 
Ben and Mike are really going to talk um, later in this presentation um, about design issues and opportunities related to separated bike lanes. Um, what I wanted to do to kind of kick things off is to provide a little higher level national context um, for this information um, on separated bike lanes. Um, next slide, please. So, so everything that we're going to be talking about today is really um, supportive of um, USDOT's current policy statement on bicycle and pedestrian accommodations. Um, so it's, it's our policy at the national level to incorporate safe and convenient walking and biking facilities. Um, we recognize that it's everyone's um, responsibility to improve conditions and opportunities for walking and biking. Um, and I, I think the third one is especially important here that, um, that we're encouraging transportation agencies to go beyond minimum standards um, to provide safe and convenient facilities. Um, so really when we, when we think and talk about separated bike lanes, um, what we're trying to do is go beyond minimum standards to really meet the needs of, of people of all ages and abilities. Um, and, and to do that, we know that comfort and safety matters. Um, and that's, that's you know, one of the, the, the core opportunities for separated bike lanes. And um, from a national perspective, um, Federal Highway Administration sees separated bike lanes as a, a really important way to implement this policy statement. Next slide, please. So as you know, our, our secretary, Secretary Anthony Fox, um, is, is really focused on pedestrian and bicycle safety. It's something that he's been talking about um, and working on um, since day one as the secretary. Um, he's, he has initiated a Safer People, Safer Streets initiative. Um, and one of the really important parts of that broader initiative is a mayor's challenge for Safer People, Safer Streets. Um, we've got uh, more than 240 cities have signed up for the mayor's challenge. And that's you know, an important thing to note here is that that's the top elected official in, in more than 200 communities in the US have really um, taken the secretary's challenge and, and proactively decided that they want to focus on pedestrian and bicycle safety. Um, we've been working with these communities over the course of the last year um, on these challenge areas that you see on the slide. Uh, um, and again, I want to point out that separated bike lanes are really um, have a direct relationship to all the items in the mayor's challenge. Um, and we've been um, coordinating with the mayor's challenge cities um, and really working to share information on separated bike lanes. Um, in particular, um, designing complete streets, designing right, gathering data um, are all things that you're going to hear as part of this presentation. Um, and they're things that we've been working with the mayor's challenge cities on um, as part of the mayor's challenge. I do want to um, remind people that, that we are, there is an awards program for the Mayor's Challenge for the communities that are participating. Um, we're encouraging those communities to submit um, nominations uh, for awards for their activities as part of the Mayor's Challenge. Um, all the cities are listed on the website. And the deadline um, for submitting information for the Mayor's Challenge awards is June 30th. Um, so it is, it is coming right up around two weeks from now. Um, but you'll see when you, when you look at the application material that um, it's not extensive um, information that, that we're requesting as part of the, the proposal. So I would encourage you um, to talk to folks in your community um, if you're participating in the Mayor's Challenge and encourage, encourage folks to, su to submit a nomination um, to really get some important recognition for the important activities over the last year. Next slide, please. So we've got, at the highest levels at DOT, we've got a full, full support to really focus on pedestrian and bicycle transportation. Um, I think it's, it's also really important to, to emphasize that Federal Highway Administration is leaning in on these issues as well. Um, so we've got a strategic implementation plan. And an important part of that strategic implementation plan is, is you know, a focus on integrated, safe, and convenient transportation system. Um, for all users. We're really focusing on sustainable transportation policies and practices. Um, those are just a few examples of, of areas that, that we are focusing on from a corporate high-level perspective um, that really relate to what we're talking about today. Um, FHWA has been supporting design flexibility. Um, we published a memo 
um, in 2013 that acknowledged formally that we support flexibility in the design of pedestrian and bicycle um, facilities really because we want to encourage and promote people to get the best outcomes and to do that often you need to have a flexible design approach. Um, we want to I want to really applaud Ashto also um, for recently um, you know pushing the envelope on the design flexibility side um, through a, a recent administrative resolution um, really sub also supporting and reinforcing the need for design flexibility. Another thing that, that we have really been focused on at FHWA is connected pedestrian and bicycle networks. Um, and when I talk about that, I'm talking about inter interconnected transportation facilities that allow people of all ages and abilities to safely and conveniently get where they want to go. Um, so we're really looking to make walking and biking a viable transportation choice for everyone. Um, a lot of our resources and tools and design information that we're putting out um, are really in service to that broader goal of encouraging our partners and stakeholders to be thinking about connected networks and not, not single kind of standalone pedestrian bicycle infrastructure projects as, as standalone things, but rather um, elements that help us get to a connected network of infrastructure. We've also been focusing on pedestrian and bicycle data, and I'll talk a little bit more about that um, as it relates to separated bike lanes. But, but from a broader perspective, we're working really to develop kind of the national capacity um, to collect and manage more and better um, data on pedestrian and bicycle volume and activity to get more information on safety um, and really to push the envelope and um, push the ball forward on the infrastructure data side. So that's something that we're working very hard on. Um, and, and also on equity, ladders of opportunity, and quality of life. Um, all of our pedestrian and bicycle activities are really under the umbrella of quality of life. Um, and, and equity is something that we're working into everything that we do um, over the course of our day-to-day -day, um, operations. Next slide, please. So I want to emphasize that, that Federal Highway, this is not something that is, that is driven purely from a, from a headquarters or D.C. perspective. Um, we've got off division offices in every state, um, and our division offices have, have really done an excellent job. I think they um, deserve a lot of credit for really leaning in with the broader organization on pedestrian and bicycle um, issues. So we've, we had our division offices, um, every single division office was engaged in pedestrian and bicycle assessments um, last year. Um, and we're working with the division offices now to do some really important and exciting follow-up activities um, to those pedestrian and bicycle assessments because, um, you know, we, we recognize that a lot of this is about shared experience, um, building relationships with our partners and stakeholders, um, and really getting kind of that on-the-ground perspective and that fine-grained analysis um, that's so critical for, for walking and biking infrastructure. Next slide, please. So these are just a few of the, the resources that FHWA has put out in the last year. Um, we've really um, kind of surged in our production of pedestrian and bicycle resources. Um, these, these focus on uh, pedestrian and bicycle facility design, data, um, implementation, case studies. Um, we really, as I, as I mentioned before, kind of all of these all of these resources are helping us to achieve our goals, and that's that's really helping our partners and stakeholders and the communities that we work with to develop connected pedestrian and bicycle networks to improve safety, to really promote equity, um, and encourage trips, encourage more people to be walking and biking, um, because we really recognize that that's in our national interest um, to accomplish all of those things. The document on the upper left is what we'll be talking about in detail today, um, and Ben is going to talk about a lot of the specific design elements that are included in that national resource. Um, so that's really kind of the, the planning and design resource from the Federal Highway perspective that we heard in talking to our partners and stakeholders is that there was some confusion among some folks on whether you were allowed to use federal funding um, to build separated bike lanes. And so um, one of the things that we're doing as part of our broader strategy to lean in on pedestrian and bicycle issues is to proactively address that and to say that that's a misconception. 
you can use federal funding to build separated bike lanes. And we wanted to make sure that there's that there's no confusion on that on that question. Next slide, please. Um, another thing that I think is really important as we kind of go into the to the information to follow is is that one of the things that we emphasized in the separated bike lane planning and design guide um, is the need to really collect data uh, before and after implementation of separated bike lanes so that um, at a national level we can get to um, have a better understanding um, of, this, of this particular transportation facility type. Um, it's absolutely critical to collect the data before implementation as well as after implementation. Um, because one of the things that, that we really want to emphasize from a, from a federal national level um, is the, the need to have a comprehensive understanding of performance for these facilities. Um, and that really comes down to crash rate. Not just knowing after you implement a facility what happened, you know, how many, how many crashes were there, what, what was the, the volume of people riding on that facility after implementation. We need to understand what it was beforehand so that we can actually understand how the crash rate changed. Um, as we start to understand that crash rate, um, I think that we will have a more comprehensive understanding of the performance. Um, and, and I think we can make stronger arguments about terminology, for example, um, like whether they are protected by claims. Next slide, please. So, so just to, to wrap things up, I want to emphasize a, a couple resources and encourage folks to, to look out for them. Um, one is called Achieving Multimodal Networks, Supplying Design Flexibility and Reducing Conflicts. Um, this is going to be um, in, in sort of the biggest pedestrian and bicycle design resource that FHWA puts out um, this year. So it's going to be a very detailed um, design resource focused on that core outcome that I talked about before, which is achieving connected multimodal networks. Um, this document is really going to follow on the design flexibility memorandum that I mentioned, um, and it's really going to describe um, specific examples of what we meant when we said we encourage and, and promote design flexibility. Um, there's a lot of information on access to transit. There's a lot of information on accessibility, um, connected networks, access to schools. Um, and it's also, there's a, a great deal of design information in there um, about reconnecting communities and, and addressing equity. Um, so I want to encourage folks to look out for that. Um, it's going to be one comprehensive resource, but there are going to be 24 separate design topics within the resource that are that were designed and built to be standalone resources that you can actually pull out um, and use, um, bring to a meeting, for example, to initiate a conversation in your community. Um, that's a resource that we're planning to publish in the next couple weeks, so keep your eye out for that. Second thing I want to talk about is the strategic agenda for pedestrian and bicycle transportation. Um, this is a document that FHWA is planning to publish next month. Um, what it's going to do is lay out um, our key strategic priorities over the next three to five years. It's going to be a very action-oriented document. It's going to be a follow-up to the National Walking Biking Study that was done in the 1990s. Um, and as I said, it's really going to lay out what we intend to focus on over the next couple years. It's going to be built around four primary goals, which are connected networks, safety, equity, and trips encouraging more activity, more walking and biking activity. Um, so keep your eye out for that. A third resource that we'll be publishing in the fall um, is a document that really focuses on what walking and biking networks look like in small town and rural communities. Because one of our key messages as we've been talking about networks is that we need walking and biking networks everywhere in all land use types. Um, but we acknowledge and recognize that the networks will look and feel different um, depending on when you're in a, whether you're in a heavily urban community or a more rural community. And so um, this multimodal networks in small town and rural communities document is really going to focus on the small town and rural side. And, and it's going to be a pretty detailed design reference for that. The last thing I want to mention is FTA, our partners at FTA, the Federal Transit Administration, are working on a guidebook for enhancing pedestrian and bicycle connections to transit. 
Um, as I mentioned, our Achieving Multimodal Networks document includes a lot of information on transit, and their guidebook is going to take that, build on it, and provide even more information to really encourage walking and biking to and from transit. So that's another resource that I would encourage you to look out for. Um, and obviously, separated bike lanes um, are a great strategy for improving bicycle access to and from transit stations. Next slide, please. So with that, I just want to uh, put up some, some key staff at FHWA that focus on pedestrian and bicycle issues. Um, I encourage you to reach out to us um, and let me know if you've got any questions either by email after the webinar or during the question and answer session. Thank you so much. Dan, back to you. Thanks very much, Dan. I appreciate it. And I apologize, everybody, for the technical glitch right there in the middle, but I think we've gotten past it. So let's roll right now into uh, the main presentation. So Ben, I'm going to send the screen over to you. If you want to take that over and uh, pull up your slides, we should be able to go ahead and get started. Great. Thank you, Dan. And thank you, Dan. Um, so thanks, everybody, for joining us uh, again today. Uh, if you were here with us last week, thanks for coming back. Um, if not, I'm just going to quickly run through a couple of pieces of information that I covered last week just so that we're all on the same page as to knowing what a separated bike lane is and really what it isn't. So on the screen here is the definition that FHWA has used in its design guide uh, for SBL. So they're an exclusive facility for bicyclists that is located within or directly adjacent to the roadway and is physically separated from motor vehicle traffic with a vertical element. So there are several uh, pieces in here that I do want to highlight. Uh, the first being the fact that it's an exclusive facility for bicyclists, so it's not necessarily a shared use path in which you might have pedestrians, joggers, rollerbladers, etc. It is only for bicyclists. Um, it's directly or it is directly adjacent to or within the roadway, meaning that uh, as you see in the photo here, it's basically in places where traffic is going to be nearby, motor vehicle traffic specifically. Uh, going to be a shared use path that's completely off street. Uh, physically separated from motor vehicle traffic with a vertical element. So that's obviously a key key distinction between a separated bike lane and just a traditional on street bike lane. So you'll see in this photo, uh, the flexible delineator sticks are what constitute the vertical element. So there has to be some sort of vertical element. Otherwise, we didn't define it as a separated bike lane. So here's a graphic from the guide just showing the differences between various bicycle facilities. So starting from the top with the least separation, you have just signed routes or shared lane markings or sharrows, so that would be a traditional class three facility, um, which really doesn't provide any separation whatsoever. Uh, the next two on-street bike lanes and on-street buffered bike lanes uh, provide separation horizontally through markings, but not vertically through any physical protection. Then you've got FBL, separated bike lanes, which we'll be talking about at length today. And then finally, the off-street trail or side path. So one of the key distinctions between side paths and separated bike lanes is that you know, even side paths may, may occasionally intersect uh, with roadways that have motor vehicle traffic, but those intersections are fairly rare. Um, separated bike lanes could kind of be almost designed similarly to side paths, but just have much more intersections. So the intersection design element, which we're going to get into at length today, is kind of a main feature of separated bike lanes. All right, and now on to new stuff. So. Going from planning, which we talked about last week, um, and which is obviously a huge portion of creating these, these types of facilities onto design. So here's a somewhat complicated, but not, not too complicated diagram, which shows the different kind of things at play um, when, you're, when you or your community might be thinking about how to design a separated bike lane. So you'll see on the upper left of this diagram, we have all the issues that go into planning. So we talked about that a little bit last week. What kind of users you have, what kind of connections you want to make, what kind of context you're in. Um, as Dan mentioned, you know, the idea of creating networks and where a separated bike lane is appropriate, where it might not be appropriate, what kind of opportunities you have. So all those pieces of information you should be thinking about, but concurrently you should also be, also be thinking about what kind of design decisions you're going to make because a lot of the planning issues impact the design and then even vice versa. So on that upper right side of this diagram is making those design decisions. So we're going to go through those four today um, in order and then we're going to uh, hear about a little bit about Chicago's experience with some of those decisions. Um, and then obviously planning and design aren't done in a vacuum either. You're also going to be thinking about funding. You're going to be thinking about outreach and performing it. And that, will, that in and of itself will inform the planning and design process. Um, you're going to be collecting data. As Dan mentioned, that's a critical uh, component of doing the evaluation that you ultimately have to do. You implement, and then at the bottom here, you evaluate. So um, FHWA is pretty, um, pretty 
strong on the idea of design flexibility, and it's great to hear that there's another design flexibility guide coming out soon on multimodal networks. Um, so in order to find the right design, you have to be pretty willing to be flexible. Um, separated bike lanes tend to be kind of a circular sort of decision-making path. Um, you might try something and find that it's not working perfectly. You might get some pushback from the community. You might get uh, suggestions from the community about how to make improvements. So really, uh, FHWA wanted to emphasize that these decisions should be, um, they should never necessarily end. It's not that it's one and done and the, the design is in the ground and it's over with. So today I'm going to talk about four pieces of the, of the design process. And I do apologize in advance for Carl being unable to join us today. So I'm going to take his sections on number three and four. So just bear with me and uh, we'll get through all of it pretty well. So the first uh, piece of the puzzle is figuring out directional and width criteria. So by that we mean a couple of things. So for directional criteria we mean is your, bike, is your cycle track or separated bike lane going to be a one-way facility or a two-way facility? Um, and that has an impact, uh, it, or that is impacted by the type of street that you're on. So in this case, this is kind of the simplest case that we see out there. It's a one-way separated bike lane on a one-way street. So in this instance, um, we recommended, or we recommend in the guide, that if you can do it, you put your separated bike lane on the left side of a one-way street. The reason being, uh, a couple reasons. One, um, when a motor vehicle driver is driving, he or she is going to have a much easier view of you if you're on his or her driver's side window. So you can picture that car that's in the, in the middle of the, of the page here. If someone's driving it, they'll be more easily to see if a biker is coming from behind. Uh, secondly, oftentimes you might have transit stops on the right sides of these one-way streets. So anytime you can avoid having that transit bike interaction, you should probably do it. Uh, we will get into transit bike interactions though later in the presentation. So here, one step a little bit more complicated, but still pretty standard. Here's a, a two-way street, and what we've recommended uh, in this type of configuration is two separate one-way separated bike lanes on a two-way street, one on each side. So this is probably one of your most uh, common uh, sort of design uh, situations that you might that you might see. And I do want to note here, you'll see all these bubbles kind of throughout on a lot of the diagrams that we're talking about, these blue and orange bubbles. So if you look at the design guide that FHWA put out, all those relate to um, pieces of information that then refer you back to various pages in the document regarding kind of the technical specifications of markings, of signage, of protection type, etc. So it's a really great resource, and uh, if you haven't looked at it yet, I'd encourage you to do so. The design, uh, the design pages are really invaluable, and I use them all the time on my projects. Here we have a slightly more complicated scenario. Um, with a two-way separated bike lane, but on a one-way street. So there may be a couple of reasons that you might find that this, uh, that this design decision makes sense. Uh, one being if you, you might have a one-way street where you're seeing, already seeing a lot of contraflow biking, so biking in the direction against traffic. So if you want to kind of prevent that and prevent even contraflow biking in a separated bike lane, well then design it so that it's a two-way facility. Obviously that does create a significantly amount of more uh, conflict at intersections so you do have to deal with that, obviously, through, through signalization strategies or, or others. Um, you might also do this if, if maybe there is a one-way street nearby, but maybe it just doesn't make sense to have the bike lane going in the other direction. Uh, maybe the land uses aren't right. Maybe this is the main street with all the retail and all the shopping that you want to uh, attract cyclists to. Maybe you don't have enough width on the other street. There could be many, many reasons why this, this configuration could make sense. Oh, and I'll point out here, you'll probably see it on a lot of diagrams, the 10 to 40 foot typical uh, marking in orange on the, on the right side there, uh, it shows the distance between, in this case, flexible delineator posts. So throughout, throughout the document, we have suggestions as to what kind of widths and what kind of distances make sense based on a lot of stakeholder, stakeholder outreach with FHWA, with AASHTO, with a lot of cities that have implemented these things. So none of these uh, are necessarily guidelines, uh, they're more so just suggestions and de design guidance rather than design standards, I should say. So here's a, a photographic example, a really good example of Prospect Park West in New York City. It's probably the most famous separated bike lane in the country because of all the lawsuits uh, surrounding it, but it really works really well. And one of the reasons that a two-way bike lane can work really well is because this is um, adjacent to Prospect Park, so there's really no intersections with streets for a good 15, 20 block uh, stretch. So you only have intersections with pedestrians, which makes obviously makes for far, far, far fewer conflicts uh, between bicyclists 
and vehicles. Uh, so here's another example of a two-way bike lane on a two-way street. So this might be an instance where you want to have bikes going in both directions, but one side of the street, for whatever reason, just isn't hospitable uh, for creating this type of facility, whether it be the presence of many driveways, whether it be more intersections. So again, like I, like I showed on the last slide with Prospect Park West, um, the idea being that uh, you might have space where having a two-way bicycle configuration makes sense and it's just an easy win. So width plays a, a pretty important factor. Um, we discussed this a little bit last week in terms of maintenance opportunities, but when you think about width, you need to think about how you're going to get vehicles in there um, to do maintenance, whether it be snow plowing, street sweeping, etc. cetera. Um, you'll see on the top right here a traditional one-way separated bike lane um, we say five feet being minimum, seven feet being preferred, and that's note that that's without necessarily the buffer. So that's just the width of the lane itself without any buffer, uh, like without any area where the vertical element might be. For the two-way facility, we say 12 feet being preferred. So these, these numbers were taken through a lot of stakeholder outreach. Um, NACTO has um, pretty much agreed with these types of numbers, um, and we look forward to seeing more uh, kind of concrete design guidance as AASHTO gets into this as well. So the next piece that you need to think about, so once you've figured out your width and directional characteristics, let's say you know, okay, I want to do a one-way separated bike lane on a one-way street, it's going to be six feet wide, we need to think about what types of separation uh, you want to use. So the guide provides many different options, but even still, that's certainly not comprehensive among the many, many choices that cities and uh, states and regions have in, in figuring out what types of uh, separation forms they're going to use. So the forms really run the gamut from inexpensive and simple to more complicated and capitally intensive. So delineator posts are probably one of the more popular uh, popular modes, uh, popular forms of separation. They're relatively inexpensive. They're easy to install. You can run them over if you have to, if you're in a vehicle in terms of emergency access and things like that. Um, and again, you know, you you need to think about it contextually. There are all sorts of reasons why certain forms of separation may work and may not. Every separated bike lane is going to have different uh, different reasons for why you might put something in. Um, here, this is in Mexico City. There's similarly we have pretty inexpensive materials. Um, it's fuzzy to say here if those uh, small reflector domes actually qualify as separated bike lane because it's not necessarily very vertical. But I did want to point out that in the back here you have those parking stops. So here's the combination of treatments, which kind of depend on the situation you have. So as you get kind of closer uh, to you on the screen here, there are a couple of driveways, which is why they replace the parking stops with those domes. Um, again, we can go really, really capitally intensive with separation. This is a raised uh, cycle track with uh, landscaping. Here, this is probably one of the more famous ones that we looked at in our, in our research, um, the Indianapolis Cultural Trail. It was a full project with federal funds, and it created a, a really robust walking and biking environment uh, in the city. Not necessarily cheap, but certainly in terms of separation, this is kind of the best uh, the best you can get. You can also get pretty creative with separation. I talked about this last week as well. Um, using bike share stations as your form of separation kind of gives you a win-win by placing the bike share near the facilities that people who are using bike share might want to use. And um, here in Seattle, you can you can see some of the whimsical ideas that you're able to do um, with separation. Here they use these blue uh, kind of Smurf things, uh, as they call them. Um, interspersed with flexible posts. So you can really get creative with this. Um, and what I didn't mention actually in any of these forms is that parked vehicles are also a form of separation and quite typical in urban environments where on-street parking is still required. So the third item that you want to look at is once you figure it out, okay, I'm going to have a one-way separated bike lane, one-way street, I know what kind of form of separation I want to use, I need to think about what kind of mid-block considerations we have to deal with. So we looked at a few of these um, in our development of the guide. We're not going to cover all of them in the presentation here, but we can certainly talk further in the Q&A. So kind of the, the biggest by far mid-block concern with a lot of places that want to implement separated bike lanes are driveways. So the guide provides um, recommendations as to site distances that you need in order to, to daylight, the, in, in this case, the parking lane, um, in order to make the turns that are coming off the roadway into the driveway and across the separated bike lane make those turns safe so that people can see cyclists coming and, uh, and, and in order to avoid them and to avoid conflict. Here you can also see at the driveway is the use of green bar comp, uh, conflict paint, which has proven to be uh, pretty helpful in uh, increasing awareness as well. 
Um, one step further complicated is if you have a two-way separated bike lane um, and driveways. So in this case, it's a, it's a very similar treatment um, overall in terms of the daylighting and the conflict paint. But you, what you do really have to watch out for is the fact that drivers who are turning in to the driveway may not be thinking that bicyclists are going to be coming in what could be considered the contraflow direction. So we have um, we have a couple of places here, um, the orange orange, uh, orange bubble number one and orange bubble number number two, where signs need to be placed to alert drivers that they are going to be crossing a bicycle facility. And you can certainly uh, indicate that it's a two-way bicycle facility with two-way bike traffic. Transit stops are another uh, what we considered mid-block consideration. Obviously, they, they can occur near intersections, but for the sake of presentation, we considered it a mid-block treatment. So here you see three different uh, different ways of approaching transit stops, kind of from top to bottom, from what we consider the most preferred to the least preferred. So on the top, um, you don't really do anything to the bike lane in terms of uh, redirecting it. Um, you have the transit vehicle with a boarding island, you have the transit vehicle stop um, in moving traffic, so this also has the benefit of not delaying the transit vehicle uh, from having to get back into traffic. Um, at the crosswalk where pedestrians cross uh, the bike lane, it's maybe a little tough to, in to indicate here on the, the photo, but that's a raised crosswalk um, with yield markings, um, warning that cyclists need to yield to pedestrians who are accessing, uh, coming off and onto that transit stop, that transit island. Uh, the second photo is what we call a bend-in situation. So here, um, you, you get a benefit of the fact that you still have a boarding island, uh, but you have to bring the bike lane inwards, um, so presumably you have to cut into the sidewalk a little bit, which can be quite expensive, obviously, um, in addition to building the island to begin with. Uh, but what you do gain here is you're able to bring the bus um, out of the way moving traffic, so if that's a consideration, this could be a, a, certainly a way that you might set it up. And then the third, the third version on the bottom is kind of the least capitally intensive, but certainly uh, potentially the most uh, it certainly provides the biggest potential for conflict between transit vehicles and cyclists. So in this case, the transit vehicle will approach the curb and likely um, stop at the curb where, uh, where transit riders may be waiting. The green bars indicate that there could be conflict. Um, and realistically, if the bus is going to pull in before a cyclist gets there, the cyclist will likely go around the bus to the left without having to go into moving traffic. So that is a benefit. But again, if you're going to go forward on this type of design, um, we definitely recommend training for both your uh, transit agencies, your transit drivers, transit operators, and, um, and certainly signs for cyclists. So here's just a couple of examples of some of the ways that uh, cities have dealt with transit, and I know Chicago is going to give us some great information later in the presentation. This is in Austin, Texas, um, a pretty uh, straight line for the cyclists, which is great, a boarding island for uh, transit riders. It hasn't been built out with capital equipment, but nonetheless, it's certainly a uh, certainly a facility that is clean and seems to work pretty well. Uh, this one also avoids any bus bike conflicts at the transit stops, but this is a bend-in treatment um, where the, the cycle track or separated bike lane has kind of come in towards the sidewalk, and it's certainly a more capitally intensive uh, project with the boarding island and the shelter built out. And then finally, um, well, before I get to the next slide, actually, this, this one shows just what I talked about a little earlier. Um, if you have a one-way street, get that bike lane on the left side of the street if you can, because then all these transit conflicts are gone. You don't have to deal with them at all. So if you have a one-way street, uh, New York City is pretty pretty regularly now. Any new bike lane, whether it be separated bike lane or regular or on street, will be on the left side of a one-way street. And here is the uh, kind of that option with transit stops involved, um, or not that option. This is the option in which uh, transit vehicles will have to yield um, yield against or bicyclists will have to yield to transit vehicles if they approach the stop first or vice versa. Uh, so it's less protection obviously for the bicyclists. Um, and this can be useful. I mean it's certainly cheaper and easier to do. And if you have a relatively low frequency transit route where you don't have that many buses coming, or even vice versa, if you expect the bike lane to be relatively lightly used, this could be a way to start out. And then if you find, you know, that those conflicts are becoming more persistent and worse than you expected, then you can certainly move to one of those other build-outs that I talked about. Um, another mid-block consideration related to parking, just generally, uh, is um, looking at ADA access. So this was a question that came up quite a bit in our stakeholder outreach and our outreach to various cities that have implemented separated bike lanes. Um, so we do provide um, some pretty specific ADA recommendations in our 
um, as to how the parking spaces should be laid out, the types of width necessary um, in order to make it ADA compliant. All the dimensions are suggested here um, uh, with kind of information in the back of the, the back of the guide. Um, so you can see here the buffer, the buffer zone between the bicycle lane and the parking spaces is much wider than it is in other places. So that's in order to provide loading space um, for ADA for ADA passengers into those vehicles. So here's a design of that. Um, kind of the, the photo on the left shows what it kind of looks like if you were to be parking, and then there's a sign on the right that shows uh, designated this parking space as accessible parking. Um, and there's a crosswalk there. It's painted on with that curb ramp, um, which allows uh, people who are accessing those ADA spaces to get across the bike lane and onto the sidewalk safely. Uh, so loading zones were another another pretty pretty big topic, especially key consideration in, uh, on urban streets in which businesses front the street and there's not necessarily any parking uh, available. So if the loading occurs at the curb, you have a couple of options. Uh, on the top, you see just, again, dedicated loading space, so not, not necessarily unlike the ADA design. I mean, certainly a little bit longer in order to accommodate potentially freight vehicles. Uh, but you have that dedicated crosswalk. You obviously sign it so that it's a dedicated loading zone. Um, and on the bottom, again, sort of similar to that bus stop uh, example where you bend in a little bit and create um, a temporary a, a, a loading zone in which uh, vehicles can park temporarily um, out of the way of moving traffic so they don't have to double park and block traffic. Um, so here is an example. This is in San Francisco of such a such a design for loading zone. You can see the UPS truck seems to be pointed seems to be parked a little bit behind the actual loading zone, but nonetheless you can sort of get the idea. Uh, the final the final big issue with design is looking at intersections and this is probably the most complicated and the the the, the feature of design which kind of has the most room for flexibility and really depends on what kind of situations you have in terms of traffic volumes in terms of what kind of streets you're crossing in terms of um, what kind of space you have to use so uh, dealing with conflicting turning movements between vehicles and through bicyclists is a significant feature of the design guide. There's several pages about it. So I'm going to go through a little bit of them now. Um, and I'm sure the Chicago examples will, again, describe a lot of this in practice. So here on, on this slide, we see three different uh, types of design. From the top, um, we have what we've called signalization. So this would be a dedicated bicycle sim signal and a dedicated right turn signal for those vehicles. So those phases would be separated. You avoid pretty much all conflict uh, between turning vehicles and uh, cyclists, I should say, you should avoid all conflicts, assuming you get compliance with the with the signal. Um, and you're able to eliminate those turning conflicts. Obviously, the con with this is a potentially increased signal cycle length um, with potentially increased wait times for bicyclists. So that it may not necessarily be optimal on pretty low volume streets, but on high volume streets where you have a lot of turns, this is definitely the way that a special, especially novice bicyclists will uh, be most comfortable. The second one, on here we've called a lateral shift. So here the bicycle lane moves out, um, here in this case in the shadow of the parking lane, and moves to where it needs to be to go through before the vehicles have an opportunity to yield. So here the focus of yielding is squarely on the vehicles, yielding to the bicyclists as they cross that green conflict bar area. Once that negotiation is complete, then the right turns and the through, the through movements for cyclists can happen at the same time. Um, and then the bottom is a slightly less robust version of that, which we call the mixing zone. Um, so in the mixing zone uh, scenario, the bicycles and the right-turning vehicles essentially share space. So this is a true negotiation between uh, bicycles and vehicles. And this can be a pretty, pretty easy design to deal with in terms of the fact that you don't need any extra space. So it's an easy one to design. Whether it works well in practice is a subject for, certainly subject for debate. Um, you definitely, uh, if you're a novice bicyclist, this is certainly potentially the most frightening uh, of, of the three options that are being shown on this page. So it's worth thinking about, and it also depends on the level of turning movements, and it's all pretty context sensitive, and you really need to do your outreach and figure out what you think uh, is best uh, for your community. So here are a couple of examples uh, of those three. So with, um, with turning movements here, you can see on the, on the right side a dedicated bicycle signal. Um, Cities are starting to install these uh, pretty frequently, and they are accepted by the MUTCD. Um, in this case, you have a bicycle signal on its red phase, and you have the left turn arrow uh, for vehicles on the green phase. So this cyclist is stopped. He's waiting for vehicles to turn left in front of him, and he won't proceed until he receives the green 
So if you're if if you have perfect compliance, this is definitely the gold standard and the way to go. Um, with a lateral shift, this is an example out of Washington D.C. I believe. Um, so you can see the cyclist is moving over, um, kind of almost in advance of vehicles coming through. Those yield markings, the shark's teeth markings uh, for vehicles indicate that it is the vehicle's responsibility to make this yielding movement. Here it's a little less uh, clear um, in the mixing zone situation where um, vehicles and cyclists almost approach the intersection at the same time and it's kind of whoever gets there first should, should be able to negotiate through the intersection. If the cyclist arrives um, behind the vehicle, the cyclist would theoretically move to the right of the vehicle and go uh, behind the vehicle to avoid that turning conflict. That doesn't always happen with novice bicyclists, however. A couple more uh, design options for turns um, that we looked at, um, we called the bend in and the bend out movement. So on the top you see the bend in. So here, the idea is to bring the cyclist closer to moving traffic in order to improve visibility. Um, in the bend out version on the bottom, it's the opposite. You're actually bringing the cyclist further away from the intersection, but by doing so, when the cyclists go through the intersection, the vehicles have already completed their turning movement to the degree that the angle is coming, uh, they're, they're coming basically straight at the bike lane. So it's, it's a lot easier to see if a bicyclist is approaching, if you're looking at it from that type of angle that is illustrated here in the bottom photo, than it might be otherwise. So here's kind of the far side of a bend-in treatment. Uh, this is uh, in Indianapolis on the cultural trail. You can see the 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 bicycle lane has moved towards the roadway so that any turns that do happen, um, the vehicles and bicyclists are close to each other and they can theoretically um, interact a little bit more uh, directly in order to figure out, or I shouldn't say figure out who has the right of way. The cyclist, if he's going, he or she is going straight, should have that right of way. But just to confirm that the, the, the driver of the vehicle has seen you. Uh, another element with intersection designs is making turns. So uh, if you're a bicyclist, you're not always going to be going straight through the intersection. So we identify um, several ways in which uh, turning movements can happen uh, for bicyclists. So I think the most, I, I shouldn't say the most common, but certainly the best way for a bicyclist to make a turn if he or she is a little bit worried about mixing with traffic is to put in a two-stage uh, turn box or sometimes known as a two-stage turning cue box. So in this case, uh, the photo on the bottom right here shows a cyclist who has presumably um, come from your left or possibly from your right, the two-way facility, um, and wants to cross the street. Um, she's moved back into this queue box and is waiting now at that red light. So the vehicles still have the green. Um, so she decided not to make the turn as a vehicle would have, but instead pulled over to wait. Um, and then when that, when that uh, light turns green, she has the benefit of already being out in front of traffic that's behind her. Um, so this can be a really valuable way um, to, to create turning situations which make people feel safe. Um, it's, off, it's done very often in places like Copenhagen. Um, and I know, you know there can be a movement against these types of things, um, but when, these, when, when, two turn, when two stage turning cue boxes are put in, that doesn't prevent you from making the turn as a vehicle would. So if you are somewhat of a more experienced bicyclist, and you do feel it's easier to make that turn with traffic and to mix in with motor vehicle traffic, this does not preclude you from doing so. Just want to get through a couple more items. Um, we didn't really look at protected intersections in the development of the guide. Uh, we discussed them a little bit, but they were still kind of making way here in the United States. Um, and in the year or two since we put, put the guide together, they're actually starting to proliferate a little bit, which is really exciting. So this is a diagram out of the uh, Mass, uh, Massachusetts DOT Separated Bike Lane Planning Design Guide, another great resource, by the way. Um, and it's becoming, place, uh, it's becoming quite common. I mean, it already exists in Europe uh, pretty frequently in places like Copenhagen. But here in the United States, we're starting to see um, some implementation here. And I know Chicago is going to talk about this as well. This is in Salt Lake City, um, one of the nation's first protected intersections that's been put in. And I think a cool story about this facility in particular, one of them was actually put in originally as purely a pilot program with really cheap, inexpensive materials. I think we might have shown a photo of that last week. And now uh, it's being reacted to so positively that they're building it out in full and they're creating these really robust intersections which get cyclists out of the way of moving traffic and kind of almost treat them more as pedestrians, if you will, because they're closer to the crosswalks. Um, so out of the Mass.Guide, guy, they have a couple of examples of protected intersections. Um, I, I would recommend taking a look at this resource and, and seeing the different variations. I'm going to let Mike from Chicago get into more of the technical nitty-gritty here. Um, 
Finally, one more thing we wanted to mention um, with the design guide is it, is it includes, as, I, as I've mentioned, a whole bunch of kind of appendices to to the, the four items that I just talked about um, in terms of markings, in terms of signage. Um, so we talk about all sorts of things in terms of markings, including how to mark the buffer types, how to mark the actual bicycle symbols in the lanes. And in this case, on the right side of the slide, you see uh, conflict bars, which appear kind of throughout a lot of the designs in the, in the design guide. This particular one with the two feet uh, of green for every six feet of blank space has been approved for experimental use by the MUTCD. So you can feel free to use this not even in your, just your separated bike lanes, but really any time you have conflicts or expected conflicts between vehicles and uh, bicyclists, this is something that can provide some benefit at a relatively inexpensive cost. And then we also provided um, all sorts of resources on signs, and um, these, these resources are then linked to various MUTCD uh, figure numbers. So you can kind of use this guide knowing that everything has been vetted through the MUTCD process. Um, we had people from the MUTCD on our stakeholder committee, um, and AASHTO as well. So all sorts of sign guidance and marking guidance that, that's given in the various diagrams throughout the guide um, can be used, um, and it is compliant with MUTCD. Um, and I think with that, I'm going to pass it over to Mike to talk about some of these practices in Chicago. Great. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Dan, for running through all that. I'm going to um, turn things over to Mike now. Uh, Mike, when you see the alert come across your screen, you should be able to take over and display your slides. Okay. I, I have it. Do you see my slides here? I do. If you go into full screen mode, you should be good to go. Sounds good. All right, uh, thank you for having me. I'm very excited to participate in this webinar to talk about some of our experiences here in Chicago. Um, we've been doing a lot. I think everything that uh, was talked about in the FHWA guide and then also briefly mentioned in the MassDOT guide, uh, there's a lot of really good information out there now, uh, including some, some NACTO uh, information in their uh, Urban Bikeway Design Guide. We've been busy in Chicago over the past uh, four or five years now, really trying to implement as much as we can to build out a better bike network uh, that provides as comfortable and as safe accommodations as possible. Uh, so what I'm going to talk about today are some of our experiences, uh, how they relate to what we've we previously heard today, uh, specifically how we use bike signals at intersections. Uh, there's a lot of intersection treatments that, that was discussed, uh, that were discussed. I think uh, bike signals, in our opinion, are, are by far uh, uh, when feasible, they're the best option to use in terms of providing the greatest separation, ensuring that as many people feel comfortable as possible riding through intersections. And then I'll highlight several design elements of a recently completed and actually in, in some ways still under construction uh, project here and right through the heart of downtown Chicago called the Loop Link, which is uh, primarily a transit project, a bus rapid transit project, but also uh, included several uh, very uh, new and innovative uh, bikeway design elements, uh, both separated bike lanes as well as uh, several intersection treatments and transit interaction issues that I'll talk about. Uh, so first and foremost, uh, I think it, it's really important to, to recognize you know, how, how we've made as much progress as, as we've made over the past five years. And that really uh, happened when we had a new administration come into office in May of 2011 when Mayor Emanuel took office, really putting an emphasis on making our streets uh, safe, accommodating, and comfortable for, for all users. Uh, and especially when it comes to bicycling, there, there's so many benefits that we all know about in terms of health, economic development, uh, transportation options, uh, et cetera, and, and, and Mayor Emanuel has been a huge supporter of building out our bikeway network and really uh, allowing us to innovate in terms of uh, building out some of these newer designs that, that we've been talking about. So having the political support has been incredibly helpful for us. So uh, to start with bicycle signals, so uh, this is mentioned, but uh, bike signals received interim MUTCD approval about two and a half years ago now uh, for, for a variety of different situations that all described here. Uh, and I'm going to talk about a few of the different ways that we use bike signals here in Chicago. So our first uh, installation of bike signals happened on Dearborn Street, which I'll show here shortly, and actually late 2012. So we actually installed uh, about 13 bike signals or intersections with bike signals in 2012, uh, mostly dealing with this curbside bike lanes, adjacent to turn lanes, and the contraflow bike lane movements uh, that are laid out here. Um, 
Dearborn Street uh, runs right through the heart of downtown Chicago. Uh, this is uh, the, kind of the before picture here. Similar to a lot of our streets, a, a kind of a, a one-way street. Uh, you know, some may consider it wide, some may not, but you know, three lanes of traffic, parking, the subway underneath, a lot of bus activity on the right side of the street. Uh, but we didn't really have any good bike accommodations through the heart of downtown. So uh, what we did is we actually took out one lane of traffic, one lane for general motor vehicle traffic to install a two-way protected bike lane, a two-way separated bike lane on the uh, what, what's shown here is the left side of the street or the west side of the street. Uh, you know, it was talked about a little bit earlier in some of the planning uh, and decision processes for you know why do we go with a two-way on a one-way street as opposed to two one-way bike lanes on adjacent one-way streets. Uh, honestly, when we did this in 2012, there was there was there was concern about just traffic impacts, and this was the first time we were doing this. So we felt that you know taking away one lane on one street uh, was was likely much more politically palpable than than taking out two lanes on two street or one lane on two different streets. Uh, you know the numbers we've seen; it, it probably uh, warrants just a, a single direction separated bike lane at this point. We're, we're up over 3,000, almost 4,000 people per day riding their bikes on this street. But I think one of the benefits to doing this, especially our first attempt at providing really good bike infrastructure downtown, it really shows a mass of people riding, and you have this concentration of people riding in both directions at all hours of the day. Thousands of people riding on this one street, really showing the success of uh, providing better bike infrastructure. So in terms of the bike signals, uh, why we use them on Dearborn Street, this is again one of 13 intersections that Dearborn Street uh, crosses. It's just over a mile long corridor. Uh, obviously this is heading northbound. Dearborn is a one-way northbound street by for, for motor vehicle traffic that is, uh, by introducing the separated bike lane up against the curb uh, the west curb, we now have a situation where we have a, a bike, a through bike lane to the left of a left turn lane. So that, that red car you see just on the right side of the slide there, uh, that person is actually sitting in a left turn lane, and then we have people uh, riding their bikes who will be heading straight here uh, once the lights turn green. So to eliminate that conflict of through, through bicyclists with turning motor vehicle traffic, we wanted to put in a bike signal. Uh, Dearborn Street also being a two-way separated bike lane, we now introduced a contraflow movement uh, on what was previously a one-way street, so we did not have signals for the southbound movement, so we had to introduce a southbound bike signal head so that people who were riding south had their own signal while they were riding. Uh, some of the elements that you see here, uh, we did choose to use the supplementary signage. So on the near side bike signal on the left, we have the signage, bikes use bike signal. Uh, maybe overkill. Uh, we, we haven't done much research or study as to how effective the signs are, but uh, from our experiences and just from what we've heard, most people don't see those signs. But it is something you can do, just an added measure of uh, uh, the, the, an added measure to alert the presence of the bike <coughs> signals. Um, we also used the near side bike signal per the MUTCD. Uh, far side bike signals are required and near side bike signals are optional. Uh, we did use the near side bike signals, again, just to highlight the bike signal. Um, and then we also positioned all of the signals for, for each lane directly above or in line with the lane of travel that they control. So the left turn arrow is directly in front of the left turn lane. The bike signals are directly uh, above or ahead of the bike lanes. Uh, so just real quick, some of the phasing. So this is a situation, this is kind of the, the phase A or the first phase of the signal cycle. Uh, so what happens is you have the left turn lane there, people queuing in the left turn lane to make their turn, they have a red arrow. Uh, the two-way separated bike lane on the left side of the street there, they have the green bike signal. Through traffic and right turning traffic uh, have the, the green ball. Uh, phase B, uh, just the bike signal goes yellow to provide the clearance phase for people riding their bikes through the intersection. Phase C, uh, the bike signal now goes to <coughs> goes to red, so people who are riding are now stopped at the intersection. People driving straight or turning right, they continue to have that green ball, so we're really not taking any green time from through through motor vehicle traffic. Uh, but now what happens is the <coughs> excuse me, the left turning traffic has a green arrow uh, to, to uh, clear out the left turn lane. Finally, uh, vehicle clearance phase as well before everything goes to all red and the cross street gets the green signal. 
Uh, one of the benefits uh, to this project and to using bike signals is just the lagging left turns, especially in an environment like downtown Chicago. A lot of pedestrians, uh, a ton of pedestrians, a lot of uh, turning movements, a lot of car traffic, a lot of bike traffic. This is the intersection looking north on Dearborn at Randolph. Uh, that restaurant straight ahead there, Paterino's, uh, that actually, before we put in the, the bike lane, and this is a before photo here from Street View, we had a lot of pedestrian crashes with left turning motorists uh, because there was never really a gap for people to turn left. We had a lot of aggressive driving behaviors. Uh, we actually had several situations where uh, motor vehicles ended up in the restaurant on the far side of the intersection there. Uh, after putting in the bike signals and the lighting left turns, uh, we now created space for people to make that left turn without the pedestrian conflict. Uh, these stats here aren't just for this intersection, it's for the entire corridor. 23% reduction in all crashes, uh, that's, that's motor vehicle crashes. 20% reduction, huge reduction in pedestrian crashes, which is a really good benefit for us downtown. We did see a slight in, increase in bike crashes, but I think Dan Goodman mentioned this earlier, when looking at the bike ridership numbers, we've seen an almost a two or three times increase in bike ridership out on Dearborn Street. So looking at the crash rates, crash rates have gone down substantially on Dearborn for people riding their bikes. And a lot of those crashes that have happened have been uh, um, minor injury crashes. Uh, we also use bike signals just with standard bike lanes and for lighting right turns. So this is Milwaukee Avenue, uh, the, our most heavily used bike corridor. We get up to 7,000 people riding their bikes per day on this street. Uh, previously, you had to uh, mix with, uh, you had to head straight here if you're riding your bike. People turning right would have to cut across the bike lane to make their right turn. And you had a lot of conflicts with right turning traffic and through bike movements. We just simply repositioned the bike lane and the right turn lane. We swapped them so that the bike lane was now curbside and put in a bike signal uh, to separate, again, the right turning movements from the through bike movements. Uh, we also installed the green pavement markings throughout the bike lane there simply because it was curbside and we did not want people to, uh, to be parking in that bike lane. We've been very happy with the results of this retrofit. Uh, overall, with our bike signals on Dearborn Street, you know, this was mentioned as well, uh, we all hear that you know, people riding their bikes don't stop at stoplights. So what we, we, we did a lot of data collection. We're still doing data collection. Uh, before we put in the bike signals, about 30% of people were stopping at a red light and waiting for the light to turn green. Um, that's not saying that they're just blowing straight through the red light, but oftentimes they would continue through when there was no cross traffic. We are now up to over 90% compliance uh, after putting in the bike signals. Uh, nowhere near perfect, but a huge increase in compliance, and uh, that that 90% number uh, is is about the same for compliance of people who are turning left with the left turn arrow. So again, not everybody's perfect, uh, but we've seen a much better uh, compliance rate for all users of the roadway. Um, we also use them for just minor uh, uh, improvements on some neighborhood streets. So this is a contraflow bike lane we installed on a residential roadway. Uh, again, previously one-way street, there was no bike signal head. We had to put in the bike signal head. Uh, pretty simple, uh, relatively inexpensive uh, retrofit, just providing a new mast arm and a couple signal heads for people who are riding in the contraflow movement. Uh, so next I'm going to talk about the loop link in our downtown bike network. So prior to loop link, so basically 2015 and earlier, 2014 and earlier, we didn't really have a, a solid downtown bike network. We had a pretty uh, lacking in terms of connectivity. Most of our bike lanes were just standard bike lanes, uh, not separated bike lanes. Uh, the only separated bike lane we had running through the heart of downtown was Dearborn Street, and that's the, the blue uh, north-south line in the middle of the screen there. What we did as part of Loop Link is we completely reconfigured our downtown bike network, looking at where transit service was provided, where we had opportunity to provide more separated bike lanes. We actually took out a couple of standard bike lanes on Madison and Canal Streets, put in, uh, and are in the process of putting in separated bike lanes on Washington Street, which is the street heading eastbound, Randolph Street heading westbound, and then a new two-way separated bike lane on Clinton Street, which is on the left side of the slide here. Um, and as part of this project, there were really three ways we looked to accommodate uh, bikes versus transit. Uh, so the first, uh, and we'll talk about it real quickly here, is just to completely 
take bike lanes off of a major transit corridor. So Madison Street, shown with the red line east-west, previously had a standard bike lane. Pretty narrow street as part of loop length. We weren't able to accommodate that bike lane. So we relocated the westbound bike lane that previously existed on Madison. We're putting it up on Randolph Street here on the top there this year. Uh, Randolph Street has no bus service. It's, it's really the only street downtown without bus service. Putting in a separated westbound bike lane on Randolph, you don't have to worry whatsoever about uh, any sort of conflicts between bikes and transit vehicles. Uh, next is the Washington Street one-way separated bike lane, which heads eastbound right through the heart of the loop. Uh, we used green pavement markings throughout uh, the entire corridor, and I'll talk about that a little bit more when I talk about some of the pedestrian interactions. Uh, bike signals, again, to separate uh, the through bike movement and right turns. And then the floating bus stop, which I will talk about here shortly, uh, and I'll talk about why we have the bike lane on the right side of the street adjacent to the transit lane and, and the bus stops uh, in a little bit here. Uh, then the third way to accommodate bikes and transit uh, is on a two-way street. So this is Clinton Street before, uh, no bike accommodations whatsoever. This is uh, looking north, Clinton Street was a, a southbound, uh, or is a southbound only street for motor vehicle traffic. We put in another two-way separated bike lane on what is the east side of the street, or if you're traveling down it on the left side of the street, completely separate from bus service, which exists on the opposite side of the street. So several different ways to accommodate bikes on streets with heavy bus volumes. Uh, three different ways shown there here in Chicago. Uh, again, on Clinton, green pavement markings to highlight the curbside bike lane, uh, bike signals for both uh, the contraflow movement as well as to separate turning uh, movements from through bike movements. So going back to Washington, so we, uh, we again, with planning and kind of the design, there was, a, there was a lot of decisions and a lot of thought put into where this bike lane goes. We ended up choosing to put it to the right of the transit islands and the bus lane uh, due to just our overall network connectivity. Washington Street from the west has a bike lane on it for uh, over five miles, so it comes in from our west side neighborhoods. It is on the right side of the street, so that was one consideration we looked at. Uh, just where the Loop Link project starts, there's a major viaduct which has a lot of constraints. Uh, getting people over to the opposite side of the street through that viaduct proved very challenging and one that we didn't think made a lot of sense. Uh, last, as people ride into the loop on Washington Street, what we found is the majority of people, the vast majority of people, want to turn right off of Washington Street and head south. So by doing this, we were able to make that right turn a lot easier without having to interact with, uh, with other through traffic on Washington or uh, by, by stopping any sort of motor vehicle movement to do so. Uh, there are two access points to every bus uh, station here, one mid-block, which you see right here in the front of the slide, and then another at the intersection. So uh, I think that's very beneficial as opposed to having uh, basically unlimited access points where, where pedestrians can access the walk or the transit station anywhere. Here we've concentrated them to two points, uh, which really helps manage some of our pedestrian bike interactions. Uh, we've done a, uh, several things to manage those interactions. Uh, the first at the mid-block crossing, shown on the left, we have a marked crosswalk with a stop bar in the bike lane. Uh, Illinois is a stop for pedestrian state, so even people who are riding their bikes must stop or yield for, for people who are in the crosswalks accessing the transit stations. We also raised the bike lane at these mid-block crossings so that it comes up to sidewalk level. So when you're riding your bike, you have another cue that you should slow down and, and yield the right of way to people who are crossing on foot. Uh, at the intersections, same thing, we provided the stop bar uh, so that people knew where they should be stopping uh, when they're riding, not to stop in, in the crosswalk. Uh, we also, the green pavement really helped to, to manage some of those potential conflicts and to hopefully alert pedestrians not to stand in the bike lane. Uh, we've been fairly pleased with the results. We haven't had a lot of people standing in the bike lane. I've been providing that refuge space, as you see in the photo on the right, for pedestrians. has really helped to keep pedestrians from standing in the bike lane. Uh, but it's going to be a learning curve. There's, there's a lot of pedestrians downtown. There's a lot of tourists downtown. So every day you have new people interacting with a, a fairly unique uh, street configuration in, in a big city. Uh, but we've been very happy with the results. We haven't seen any major crashes uh, whatsoever on this corridor. Uh, last, I'm going to talk about our first attempt of a protected intersection. This was talked about earlier. Uh, and I, I think this can really be in a way, compared to the bend out scenario that was discussed, uh, that's 
that's talked about in the FHWA separated bike lane planning and design guide. Uh, I think there's, there's, there's the, the main point of installing a protected intersection is really to, or a few main points, is to provide protection for people riding up to and through the intersection so that they're always protected uh, and to really limit the potential conflicts to one point. So that one point is kind of where you see the, the motor vehicle here with the person riding their bike. You always know you'll have potential at that one point. You don't have to worry about where you're going to cross over the, the right turn lane or where the right turning motorist is going to cross over the bike lane. Uh, we really want to make it clear that there's one conflict point and then manage speed so that everybody's traveling through here at slower speeds and so that eye contact can be made as you travel through the intersection. Uh, the most important design elements are what I'd call would be number two, as shown here, the forward bicycle queuing area, and the motorist yield zone number three, uh, which I'll talk about here shortly. So here is our protective intersection. Because it does uh, fall at the intersection of two one-way streets, uh, it, it's not fully protected on all corners. That's just not necessary. Uh, you have an eastbound separated bike lane. So from, from right to left on the screen is eastbound and then a uh, northbound buffered bike lane. So from top to bottom is the northbound buffered bike lane. And the two critical elements, again, are the motorist yield zone. So that's kind of near the, the corner curb island on the bottom right of the intersection there. Uh, we provided eight and a half feet clear for people to be able to turn out of the turn lane and, and position themselves to, to look for bicyclists coming uh, from south to north. The MassDOT guide recommends six to 16 and a half feet. Uh, Honestly, I'd err on the, side, the, the higher side of that uh, whenever possible, um, just so that you have more room for people who are turning to pull out of the lane and, and make eye contact with people riding. The forward bicycle queuing area is at seven feet. So that's for people traveling eastbound in the separated bike lane who want to turn left or turn what would be down on the screen here. They have seven feet to get out of the separated bike lanes so they're not blocking through bike traffic. Uh, recommended in the MassDOT guide is greater than six feet. Seven feet is plenty of room to get your bike out of the through travel lane. Um, the protected intersection also provides a, a, a form of a left turn uh, accommodation similar to the two-stage turn cue box which was talked about earlier and what you see on the right. This person on the left here if they wanted to turn left as they got to the intersection, they would turn left, sit in that bicycle queuing area, out of through bicycle traffic. Similar to the two-stage turn box that's shown on the right, the benefit and the difference with the protected intersection is you are fully protected throughout that turn. You have that concrete separation protecting you from uh, any sort of motor vehicle encroachment. Uh, here's a, an example of it, how it works. Uh, you know, we have a tight corner radii to encourage slower turning speeds and to encourage eye contact. Uh, some of the benefits of this intersection are two one-way streets, so we aren't as constrained with the, the turning movement. People who are turning around the protected intersection can turn into any receiving lane on the, 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 the street that goes uh, left right across the screen here. Uh, the one change that we'd make, we'd probably make that bike lane opening heading from uh, the top of the screen to the bottom of the screen a little bit narrower to provide an increase in that eight and a half feet of motorist queuing area, maybe up to 10 or 11 feet, just to give people a little bit more room to make the turn before they uh, have to stop and look for cyclists coming uh, on their right. Uh, lessons learned. This is a very new treatment that we've installed. Uh, this was right after we installed it. Uh, I'd say we, the, the facility wasn't even open yet. So a lot of people driving in the protected intersection. This wasn't the only example. We thought the green pavement marking was uh, very clear as to what the, the lane was for. Obviously, that wasn't the case. Uh, this was our previous uh, or the initial installation. We had the, the right turning vehicles yield to bikes and peds. Uh, with just the green pavement markings approaching the intersection. What we heard from people is that right turn arrow on that sign. People interpreted that as they should get over to the right and, and head through that very narrow opening, uh, which obviously is not the intent. Uh, there's also no bollards here uh, with the original installation. We very quickly retrofitted that design, put up a more commonly used lane designation sign, uh, and then also several bollards uh, to just to, to tighten that opening even more. We haven't had any issues since it's opened in early 2016, so a handful of months here. Uh, we are monitoring the situation uh, or, or the design. 
Uh, no major crashes to date, uh, but we are doing a lot of data collection to really gain an understanding of how this protected intersection design works in an environment with a lot of car traffic, a lot of bike traffic, and a lot of pedestrian traffic. So with that, that is all I have. Thank you. Great. Thanks very much, uh, Mike. And I'll, um, I'll take the screen back uh, from you all. And uh, let's see. I'll pull up a slide here I have for the Q&A. All right. So let's uh, get right into the questions, because uh, we got quite a few. And so I want to get through as many of them as possible. Um, first, just cutting back to maybe the beginning of Ben's presentation, um, a lot of questions just about sort of different criteria that people might use to decide whether to have a uh, uh, one-way um, protected bike lane or a separated bike lane on each side of the street or go for a two-way uh, 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 protected or separated bike lane on one side of the street. Are there any kinds of rules of thumb or things you'd want to think about we hit, you've hit a lot of them. I just want to kind of recap some of those things that might go into that decision. Sure, yeah. I, I don't think there's any specific rule, rules of thumb. We certainly didn't outline any specific numbers um, in the separated bike lane planning design guide. But um, I would say it's kind of a, a feel sort of situation. Number of driveways is definitely a big thing. So let's say you have a street where one side has, you know, two conflict points over maybe seven blocks and the other side has 13. Maybe that could be a reason why it might work out. Um, it really, really depends on the character of the street, and I think the whole kind of the, the one of the overarching points of of the product of this work was the the goal for design flexibility. And there there are not necessarily any hard and fast rules, so it's something that you have to think about. Um, it should be multidisciplinary. It should be with your engineers and your planners to figure out you know what kind of land uses do people want to access, um, things like that. So I, I'm sorry, but I don't think we really have any hard and fast rules for those types of decisions. Yeah, and I think that that's sort of the, the answer that I had in mind. Um, kind of, you know, you really got to think about all those various factors. And I was in my head thinking about sort of, like you said, kind of counting up the conflict points on different sides of the street and kind of going at it from that angle and making sure that you're, um, you know, you, you don't want to create a lot of conflicts if you can um, and maybe avoid avoid your bus routes and things like that. I don't know, if Mike, if you have any rules of thumb, things that you all look for when you're, thinking about corridors where you want to put these. I mean, you showed some maps of your overall network, and you're kind of thinking about it as a, from a, a, the network as a whole and kind of deciding from there where your routes are going to go. Yeah, in Chicago, we uh, primarily we have, contrary to what you saw here, primarily we have uh, one-way separated bike lanes on one-way streets, uh, or excuse me, on two-way streets, so one-way separated bike lane on each side of the street. A lot of our decision points come down to just roadway width, parking situations, how much parking can we get rid of, uh, but then also the conflicts. Uh, a two-way, we, we actually haven't installed a two-way two -way separated bike lane on a two-way street here in Chicago to date. Uh, our two two-way separated bike lanes are both on one-way streets, which, which uh, while introducing conflicts, actually limits conflicts when compared to looking at a two-way street. Uh, I think the two-way separated bike lanes, they're, you know, I think, I talked about our reasoning for, for Dearborn. Uh, they can add to the cost because you you have to, you 100% have to provide signalization for that contra flow movement. Um, but I think the, the, we prefer the one-way separated bike lanes wherever possible. Uh, but on one-way streets, we are definitely looking at the two-way as an option. Uh, Mike, just a follow-up question. You, you reported some numbers that you had for uh, your increases in ridership. Clearly, that's something that you all are monitoring. Uh, I, I'm curious about after you put in the separated bike lanes between before you had them and after, did you notice a lot of people or any riders like still after the fact that or after those went in that are still riding in the lanes uh, with traffic uh, as opposed to using the separated bike lanes? Or do you have a sense of what the split is between how many people are using them and how many aren't still? Uh, yeah, definitely. We definitely we we've noticed that it's not a huge problem. Um, uh, so on Washington Street, for example, the, the downtown corridor, the Loop Lane corridor, uh, one of the first things we heard, uh, you know, there's a lot of misconceptions about how people ride. The first thing we heard is nobody's using the bike lane, everybody's riding in the bus lane. And some people do ride in the bus lane because you, it's a 12-foot lane uh, where you have a lot of space. But what, what we saw when we actually did the data collection, most people riding in the bus lane were uh, messengers who, who, you know, they, they're, they don't want to ride in separated bike lanes no matter where we put them. Uh, which they don't have to. So we did a lot of data collection. Washington Street just opened this January. 
Uh, we've been out there every week or two doing data collection. We have about a 20 to 25 percent uh, mode share in terms of people riding bikes on the corridor during the morning rush hour. So a huge number of people riding. Of the people riding, anywhere from 92 to 95 percent of the people riding are actually in the bike lane itself. So having the data is really important to uh, uh, re, 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 uh, provide a rebuttal to a lot of the, the comments that we hear that you know people see one person riding in the bus lane and they make an assumption that everybody's riding in the bus lane. So we've seen the vast majority of people actually using the bike lanes themselves. Great. Okay. Um, ben, I'll cut back to you for a question about parking uh, and uh, and driveways. There are a few comments that came in about um, the the toughest sell so far for some people on doing these is that 20 foot um, minimum uh, parking di the distance on the either side of a driveway uh, where you have to restrict parking. I think what you said is 20 feet in either direction uh, is really uh, limits, I guess, the um, the availability of space. Uh, to put in a separated bike lane on some corridors where there are a lot of driveways. Is there any flexibility with that 20-foot distance? Is that a pretty hard and fast um, distance, or does that scale up or down depending on any number of factors? Um, I, would, I wouldn't recommend scaling it down necessarily. I mean, I guess that you could probably scale it up if, if it's on a very high-speed roadway. Um, but yeah, no, it's just a... I don't want to say it's an unfortunate side effect, but I mean, you have to, you have to provide sight distance. Otherwise, People could get hit. I mean, it's it's uh, it just kind of is what it is. Um, and I think the benefit that you get from creating a separated bike lane, you have to decide if your community feels that it's worth losing a couple of parking spaces on either side. Um, you can remember that you can use that daylighting space for all sorts of things. It doesn't have to just be blank concrete. It could be bicycle parking. Um, it could be other 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 things that don't necessarily obscure sight. So, um, but I think in the guide we do recommend 20 feet, if I recall. Um, and that is that was based on a, a pretty pretty comprehensive review with people from Ashto and MUTCD as uh, being appropriate. Right. Okay. And yeah, and then just this is Dan. Just to add on that, one of the things that we did talk about in the planning chapter is 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 the idea that that as a potential strategy for for addressing that, we encourage people to look for additional parking on side streets or on other parallel corridors. So that as part of the implementation of, of a specific facility, if you're going to lose some on-street parking, um, as, as part of the same conversation, you can talk about um, when and where you'll you'll be concurrently adding parking. Yeah. And, and Mike, uh, for you, I mean, is that is that one of the bigger issues that you all, you all face when you want to uh, work for corridors is, is kind of dealing with where the parking's going to go and, and all that? Yes. Yes, no doubt. Uh, we would not go below that 20-foot minimum, and actually in Chicago we, we prefer a 30-foot minimum. Uh, we've done a handful of projects, uh, three at the top, I didn't think of three at the top of my head, where we've actually taken out over 50% of the parking on the corridor to put separated bike lanes on both sides of the street to make them fit, otherwise they wouldn't fit with parking. Uh, if you'd asked me before any one of those projects if it was possible, I would have told you no. But doing your homework, doing your data collection, talking to businesses, talking to the stakeholders, figuring out why people are parking there, uh, and, and most of the time figuring out people are parking there all day and not moving their car, people soon start you know, accepting some parking loss. If you can make some changes to loading zones, add parking to side streets, et cetera, it's, it's a lot of work. But I think the benefit definitely outweighs uh, the, the work that needs to go into it. But Yes, you know, parking is by far the biggest challenge we face um, in, in terms of putting in separated bike lanes. And then real quick on the driveway issue, I agree. You know, a lot of driveways does make for a very challenging design, but I'd also look at can you consolidate any driveways or close any driveways that aren't needed anymore um, uh, to make it a little more uh, attainable to, to, to put in the separated bike lane. A great point, yeah. Um, getting to the, the signal issue, um, you, you mentioned when you showed your, your uh, bike signals uh, for the protected phases um, at some of, your, some of your intersections, you mentioned the requirement to have the far side signal, and then you all opted for the near side as well. Can you talk about the decision behind uh, putting in the near side signal and maybe uh, any locations where you don't have that, or is that uh, all across the board you use the near side and far side? Uh, at this point, we use the near side and far side. I don't. I, I, I haven't been involved too heavily in the design and the signal design. Uh, from what I know, I think just more so to, for added visibility. That's really kind of the one reason behind it. Okay, great. And, and, uh, and, and, and I'll, I'll, 
Edmund. I'm sorry, Dan. Dan, I just wanted to point out that um, uh, the METCD does require near side signals when the far side signal is 120 feet or further from the stop bar. So basically, if you have a really large intersection that you need to cross, then the near side signal becomes a requirement. Yeah, that was my next question. I figured it was something uh, distance related. And I had a few questions from people wondering if um, as vehicles approach, if, if there's ever any confusion with if there is just the far side signal, if that's maybe sometimes mistaken for the green bulb for the vehicles and not, not known to be a bike signal. I don't know if, if either of you have experience or, or have anecdotal evidence on that. Uh, I, I know that was Sorry, okay, go, go ahead. ahead. Oh, I, no, said, I, knew, I know there was a conversation piece when uh, the, 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 the signal approval was going through uh, the METCD uh, interim approval process, but we haven't really seen that as being an issue at all. Uh, we've done a lot of observation. Uh, it, 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 again, it's mostly anecdotal, but from, from looking at when people do violate the left turn arrow, it's, it's based on a choice. They're often looking and seeing no, nobody coming. Uh, it, it's not, it doesn't appear to be just due to confusion. Cool. And Ben, would, did you have something on that? Oh, no, I just wanted to add that we didn't hear that specific concern from any. We, we interviewed about 30 or 40 cities uh, putting this guide together, and that never came up once, interestingly. OK, great. Uh, and Mike, uh, one, one question that came up quite a bit. I saw a lot of your pictures uh, where you, know, you had a lot, of, a lot maybe a lot of snow on the sidewalk and uh, none in your uh, separated bike lanes. It seemed to be pretty well uh, maintained. I wonder if you have any tips or pointers from some of our uh, winter weather cities that uh, things that you all do to make sure that you keep those things clear of snow, especially some of your examples where they're sort of behind the, uh, the transit platforms and things like that where you, it seems like it'd be fairly difficult to get through there and, and clear those. I could give an hour and a half long webinar on snow, snow maintenance if you want. <laughs> uh, so real quick, we, we have a variety of different pieces of equipment. Downtown, we use a very small uh, Kubota, uh, which can fit in a five-foot space. The bike lane you see behind the transit station is six feet. Uh, but yes, you know, designing to uh, widths that still allow maintenance is incredibly important, uh, especially when you have snow. Uh, and that's something we consider in all of our projects. Yeah, and I, a follow-on question, I guess, is that was that a challenge when you first started doing these? Was that a challenge to get your maintenance crews kind of on board with? With this, with all the additional work, I mean, it, it does seem like it's a it's a bit of a an effort to to do all that. Um, yes and no. It was it was you know it was a challenge, but it wasn't it wasn't something that you know took a lot of time. It was just you know making sure that everybody was aware of the changes, where they were happening, what it meant for operations, who was responsible for doing what. Uh, you know. We we have so we had a lot of conversations with our, our crews who do street sweeping. Uh, we ended up taking on a lot of the street sweeping. We purchased some equipment. Um, so it's just it's a coordination effort. It it can be done. Um, uh, yeah. Again, I, <laughs> I, I I I could talk a lot about maintenance, but it is something that you know, if anyone has any questions, by all means reach out. But uh, yeah, it it requires a lot of coordination, but it it, it can be done. Okay, great. Well, we'll uh, we'll hold that topic for our next webinar then. I uh, appreciate that. Thanks, uh, everybody. I, I unfortunately have to say we, we are out of time for questions, but I do hope that you will follow up with us with any of the topics that you need uh, uh, answers to or, or any follow-up questions that you'd like to send to us. We'd be glad to kind of push you in the right direction. Um, we uh, I want to remind everybody uh, once again uh, that as the webinar closes today, uh, you're going to receive a brief survey. Uh, it's going to appear just on your computer once once you close out. We'd really appreciate your feedback uh, and your comments on what we presented today and maybe how we can improve uh, future sessions. Um, you'll also be received a little bit later today an email uh, with a link to our archive page, uh, which is where we're going to post the presentation materials as well as the recording from the session. Uh, you can also find in that email uh, instructions for downloading uh, your certificate of attendance. Uh, I want to say uh, just thank you again to Dan Goodman, uh, Ben Rosenblatt, and Mike Amson for delivering uh, today's presentation. Uh, and I want to say thanks to all of you uh, for attending today's uh, PBIC webinar. And I hope everyone has a great day. Thanks.